Hello and welcome to Personal Record, a podcast that examines why runners run. I am your host, Timothy Clark. Today we are joined by Shane Finn. Shane is a public speaker, entrepreneur, a philanthropist, an endurance athlete, and a little known fact about him, he is the Irish Cristiano Ronaldo. He is the paler, pastier version of Cristiano. So if any of you ladies out there are looking for an Irish wannabe soccer player, he is your man. Uh, Shane has done some pretty fascinating things in his 25 short years here on this planet. He has most recently, uh, and probably most famously so far, ran 24 marathons in 24 days. He, that is the thing that separates him. Obviously he runs marathons, obviously he does Ironmans, but everyone on the show does that. But he decided to up the ante and did 24 marathons in 24 days to raise money and raise awareness for spina bifida and hydrocephalus. Uh, Shane actually managed to raise 142,000 euro or about 165,000 thousand dollars in that attempt which is very impressive uh and an amazing thing and we are honored to have him here so shane thank you very much for joining us and welcome to the show thank you so much for having me i appreciate it. it's quite the intro <laughs> everyone says it again it's it's uh it's i'm only i'm only talking about the things that you guys have done awesome. uh you know the i think everyone is kind of uh, uh overwhelmed by their own successes of course uh, especially when they're when they're listed in order like that yeah <laughs> um so 24 marathons in 24 days. What, what, why, why, uh, why yeah. would you do that? I guess that's the, that's the big question. Um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I mean, you know, I suppose my, my endurance career kind of started quite unknowing to myself. I didn't really know what I was doing as the, which is the case of a lot of endurance athletes. I mean, my own background as a teenager, I played, you know, Gaelic sports at home. We have our own kind of football, played rugby, I actually played golf competitively as a younger kid. Um, you know, so endurance sports, well, I, you know, I didn't, I ran cross country for school because I loved to compete. That was it really. I didn't do it because I love running, but you know, I guess I kind of turned 18, 19, you know, you leave school, we, we go to college, um, you know, I was, things are changing. I just needed something to kind of, I guess, to stimulate me a small bit. And, uh, yeah, in 2010, I ran my first marathon in Dingle where I, where I'm from back home in Ireland. And, uh, yeah, I just, you know, didn't respect it. Um, the number one rule of endurance is to respect, respect what you're doing, what you're about to do. And that I did not do at the start. So, yeah, I almost died doing my first marathon. It wasn't very pretty, but got it done and, and managed to raise 8,000 euros for, for, for Spina Bifida and Hydrocephalus Ireland. Um, you know, that was good. A, a baptism of fire for sure. I was only 18. And, uh, you know, I I guess maybe it's a trait of my personality. I got really, really pissed off after that marathon because I knew I didn't do very well. I think it was like 450 or something like that. And, you know, I was like, I can do better than this. And then it, it just turned into this complete and utter addiction. Um, I guess it, it was a positive thing, you know, as, and, and then as things developed, you know, my first cousin, Mary, she actually lives with the condition spina bifida and hydrocephalus. So, you know, she's been a massive motivator to me, um, you know, and then I did the New York City marathon marathon um 2011 and then you know i was just i knew that i needed to do something else in order to raise funds for for this charity back home in ireland that needed that needed help big time and then i decided to run from dublin to dingle uh which is literally ireland's a bit smaller than the usa so it's straight across the country in 12 days from the capital to, to my little hometown um we raised just over thirty thousand euros which which was great you know we we Got a lot of stuff wrong, uh, made a lot of mistakes, so that, learned that a was, lot of stuff. That was prior to your 24 marathons in 24 days. You actually decided to run 12 marathons yeah, in 24 days. Yeah, that was in 2014. Baby um, steps, baby steps. Baby yeah. steps, you know, <laughs> and it was, I suppose it was my first kind of step into this kind of multi-day endurance stuff um you know we got it done i think i got through it pretty unscathed i i did I, I realized one thing i said that you know i do have the mental capacity to do these things so i was like all right that's a positive kind of laid low for a little while after that uh, you know i worked on building my business with my business partner at home um and did a couple of iron mans did my first iron man the reason i signed up for my iron man was because it bothered me that i couldn't swim i could not swim um so i signed up to do my first iron with my friend out in melbourne australia I was another baptism of fire. I was like, all right, I'm annoyed. I couldn't do very well at this. I'm going to get much better. I hope to, like yourself, maybe someday get to Kona in the next five, six years. And we'll see We'll see where that takes me. But then, you know, I suppose the 24 marathons idea came into my head of Christmas 2015. I'll, again, I'll never forget where I was. So my first cousin, Mary, obviously life is very difficult for her and we're very, very close. And uh, it would upset me at how 
much pain she goes through on a daily basis and it's not just a nine to five thing you know she's in pain all day every day so 24 hours a day so because she's in pain 24 hours a day I said that's my number I gotta run 24 marathons in 24 days to represent the 24 hours a day for somebody with a disability and and their family I think that's really really important too because it's not just the person with the disability who suffers it's it's their family too so it's a kind of a lifelong full day seven days a week 12 months a year thing so yeah, that no, was no breaks on that no breaks on that you know and i knew going into the 24 marathon said it's going to be tough for 24 days but when my 24 days is over my life goes back to normal to some degree um whereas you know the people i'm representing and the people i'm doing it for you know they're still going to find it very very tough so yeah, that, that's kind of, a, I suppose, a, a really, really shortened version of a, of a quite a long story. Right. But uh, that, you know, that went off pretty well. We were really happy with it. And, uh, I, you know, as some people may understand or some people may not understand, I absolutely loved every minute of it. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, it was filmed for a documentary back at home in Ireland, things like that. So it was such a good buzz. And, uh, yeah, it was challenging. I mean, don't get me wrong, like, there was days, you know, I think day seven, I almost tore my calf, didn't tear. Day 19, my right shoulder kind of stopped working, but I also ran my fastest marathon. So it's just, <laughs> it's crazy kind of how, you know, your body adapts and does these things. And I enjoy exploring that. And uh, yeah, I'm going to gonna continue to do so for sure. So you you continue to up the ante, you know, like you said, you, you ran your first marathon and it was, you, you didn't like how you did, you know, so you wanted to do better. You did your first Ironman, you didn't like how you did, so you wanted to do better. You know, you ran your 12 marathons in 12 days, you want to do better. So obviously after the 24 marathons in 24 days, uh, you actually have one more thing planned. Well, I'm sure not one more, but the yeah. next thing planned yeah. is uh, is coming up in 2019. Can you tell Can you tell us a little bit about what you're planning on doing? Yeah, I remember, you know, the week after the 24 marathons finished, and I found it very strange. I've been from being followed by a film crew for a month, literally from seven in the morning till 10 o'clock at night, you know, with all the buzz, the crew, support crew to being you know to going i went back running on the i finished on a saturday i was back i went back for a run on monday morning and you know i i, I had no intention of doing anything else again for a long long time um i got on did a, you do that i'm sorry not to interrupt did you do that just because or did you do that just because you you felt like you had to um, dean carnazis does similar things yeah he's like, i you know what i woke up on sunday and i didn't do anything so i finished on saturday sunday i didn't do anything i just walked my dog and ate a lot of food and then on monday i just felt the need to i was sore and i knew that if i ran i might not be as sore afterwards so it was almost part of my recovery was to continue to run um just like five six seven k sure. nothing too nothing too crazy you know and then yeah my mind was at peace i was happy with what i'd achieved and the fundraising was still going on and stuff like that and then i flew actually here to the states um to do some work with sacred heart university in connecticut i was in a cafe one day having a coffee and my phone rang. Um, usually when I'm in the States, you know, the guys from the charity back at home might not call me, um, but they called twice. So I was like, all right, something must be up. So I answered the phone and they said they had bad news. And I first thought that maybe, you know, we did something wrong during 24 marathons. We're getting sued. I didn't know what was happening. And um, yeah, basically about three weeks after the 24 marathons had finished, the charity got their funding cut by 50 grand. And uh, yeah, it got me, I got really, really angry. <laughs> I was like, if there was a, you know, I was sitting beside a window in this little cafe in Fairfield in Connecticut and I just want to put my fist through the window. I got so angry out of it. So in my mind, instead of raising 142 grand, I only raised 92 because they, they just got cut another 50 grand. Um, you know, so that made me quite angry and I was sitting there in that cafe. I was like, all right, that's a sign. You know, God works in strange ways and I think that's one of those things that he's just told me that, you know, you're not done, my friend. You gotta, you gotta go again. This is what you need to do. This is your calling. And uh, yeah, I was sitting there in that cafe. I took a walk down as far as the beach, um, down to the Atlantic Ocean. I said, "Yep, that's it. Next one is America because we're running out of roads in Ireland." So <laughs> I didn't know how, at the at the point at that point I had no idea how we we're gonna format it, how we we're gonna do it. You know, I had done twelve and twelve. I'd done twenty four. I was like all right, I can't physically possibly run the whole continent in 36 days. That is not possible. And, you know, with logistics and things like that, support crew, film crew, I couldn't ask, you know, if I wanted to run the whole country, it was going to take me over 100 days. So I couldn't ask a whole team of people to come with me for 100 days. That would have been, you know, selfish and, and on my part, that's what I felt. But I was like, right, let's break this up into 36. So the plan is on March 29th, which is 
not too far away. Um, I'm leaving the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco and I'm going to ultra run and ultra bike my way across the United States, finishing on May 3rd on the Brooklyn Bridge. Um, it's like four and a half thousand kilometers the route we're taking. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to bike kind of 250 to 300 K a day for three days. And then I'm going to run 50 to 60 K a day for three days. So that's a six day block. I repeat that six day block six times and that gets me from uh, California to the Big Apple. So you know, we're, we're kind of at the stage at the moment where we're still planning out like the really fine, fine details about the route, all that kind of stuff, building a website, those kind of things. Uh, we've the last day planned out. We're going from Fairfield in Connecticut again down to uh, Brooklyn and we have the first couple of days planned out. There's a there's going to be a few quiet days in the middle where we won't see a lot of other human beings and a, a lot of things, but uh, I'm I'm like really excited already about it I, I really can't wait you know if you told me that you know plans have changed and instead of coming home and from providence airport on thursday you got to fly to san francisco we'll ship your bikes over and we'll meet you there i'd be like all right let's do it let's go so it's uh it's just one of the, i don't know what it is if it's a uh, my personality or what it is inside me but i'm just uh yeah i'm super excited that's actually a question i ask a lot of uh, a lot of my guests is uh like what is it that drives you to do these things? I mean, these are not normal things. No, you know, to say, yeah, to say the so, least. yeah. And so, and so, what what is it that drives you? I mean, you you set very high goals for yourself. Even sure. even just that twenty four marathons in uh, twenty four days, you you set a goal of a hundred thousand uh, euro, euro to yeah. raise. You end up obviously raising one hundred forty two thousand. Yeah, I mean, that's a that's a bold goal to set for yourself. Yeah, you know? that's that's pretty impressive. I, there was no real thought behind the hundred grand. It was just. It was a hundred, so it was six figures. I was like, "Yes, do it." You know, I don't know what, why, no great plan of how we were going to do it or not. You know, I I just put a hundred grand in my head because it was a big figure, and you know, it was a it would have been the single biggest fundraiser ever the charity had ever done or any any money they'd ever received. So you know, we succeeded that goal. I was like, you know, as you do, you always try set higher goals when you hit a target, and you know, I hope we have an actual fundraising figure set yet for the states because it's going to be we could figure out some costs and stuff like that but i would hope to uh break through that 142 grand barrier again this time and i, I don't know the question you guys was it an answer to the question like why do you do these things I, I often have these deep deep thoughts and conversations with myself and for me personally and it might be different for other people uh, maybe you can kind of maybe resonate with this a small bit coming from the uh the professional triathlon background was there's there's two sides for, for me obviously I'm, you know, I'm an ambassador for spina bifida and hydrocephalus, hydrocephalus back in ireland and i'm very very motivated by that to help other people but on the flip side there's a there's a like this almost kind of like semi-dark side where you're just want to find out how far you can go yeah. i don't know what it is and it, there's a small percentage of people on the planet who, who who will continue to do that and as great and all as i felt after the 24 marathons two weeks afterwards i was like didn't find your limit you know you got that's you can go further you know so i guess almost straight away i knew i said i wasn't looking to do something but almost straight away i was already questioning how far further can i go and it's when you start doing these things you realize that the human body is actually a pretty spectacular thing and when you set your mind to something you can do it so like i said i guess there's two sides to the story you know the charity aspect is obviously very important for me but i'm in this constant battle with myself too to find out uh how far I can physically push myself. It's a strange little, uh, strange little journey to be on. Do you, I mean, do you have doubts about what you're doing? Why, you know, like how, whether or not you can do it? And if so, how do you, how do you deal with those doubts? I guess, you know, the, the 24 marathons was, was my first big, I know the 12 marathons, you know, 12 yeah, days. No can, big deal. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, I guess when, when you look at it, the grander scheme of things, you know, the 24 marathons, it was completely unknown territory. You know, there's, we have a couple of guys back home who have done kind of create like, we have a guy in, in a home, his name is Jerry Duffy. He won the deck Ironman, um, by like 22 hours a couple of years ago. It's like 10 Ironmans in 10 days at race in England and stuff like that. So I do have a couple of people at home who, who can advise me and things like that. And, you know, it's just take, take take every day as it comes i know that might sound like like i'm not brushing off the question but that is like that is literally what i did you know you at the break you can't you can't look at the enormity of the task you have to no, look at the task if you google it. training plans to run 24 marathons in 24 days on the internet nothing comes up so uh you know it's just my my my, my tactic going in was to get as fit and as aerobically fit and strong as i possibly could i basically trained for it as if I was doing a massive Ironman. So I did a lot of running, obviously. I did a lot of bike work and a lot of swimming, a lot of gym work, a lot of yoga. 
I just tried to make my body as efficient as I could aerobically and physically. And then, you know, 10 days in, maybe, maybe 11 days in the, I was kind of like, all right, I think I'm starting to adapt. So, you know, I, I do a lot of study and I actually train a lot. And anybody I train at home, we do a lot of heart rate training. And I would take every single night I'd finish, there'd be, you know, I'd be doing interviews, all this radio interviews, all kinds of, I would take 30 minutes every night and to write down literally on a piece of paper how I felt, my heart rates from the day. And from when I started to when I finished, my heart rate dropped about 10 beats on average. So in my head, uh, you know, as tough and all as it was, technically I was getting fitter as the 24 marins went on. And day 19 was my fastest day. But my right shoulder started work, stopped working, um, so I couldn't lift my garment up to stop it. So all this kind of weird <laughs> stuff. So, but it, you know, a, a physical therapy session, things like that, sorted mm-hmm. it out. Um, again, there's always doubts. You know, there's always things that can go wrong. Um, I think you know it's the same as you know you look at you look at doing an Ironman. You control what you can control. If you get a flat, you get a flat. You just got to fix it. I guess this thing for us going across America next year will be pretty similar. We'll be completely out of our depth. We're in a new country. We're we're you know we're we're, we're outsiders. You know if things go wrong, we, you know we don't really have anybody to call. Um, so it, it's going to be more of an adventure, and it's going to be more of an endurance test for me personally too. Cooped up in an RV with the crew for for 35, 36 days. Yeah, you know, I won't have my own hotel room and all that kind of stuff. But with regards to doubts, yeah, you think about them, but you know they're I try to take them take them head on and take every day as it comes. You, you seem to do a lot of, um, I always say like, uh, fitness is an experiment on yourself and you, you seem to take this to, again, like an extreme level. Like you're, you're writing, you're, you're like, you're, you're writing down how you feel, your heart rate, you're keeping track of all these things. Like you're, you're a scientist. Sure. You're, I guess you're, uh, and you're an experimenting on yourself. And I guess. Yeah. Some of that some of the experiment they might get a little dangerous, Yeah. but, uh, you're, that's exactly what you're doing. And, um, I don't, what, what have you learned in that process? Uh, what I've learned is that one of the biggest skills I've, I've I've taught myself over the last four years, and it's something I just wish that more endurance, not not even endurance athletes, even people starting out in the endurance world, is the, is literally, and again, this sounds so simple, is the skill of listening to your body, whether that's in competition or in training. So if I'm training for the 24 miles, 24 days, my plan is to run 20 miles on Saturday. I wake up Saturday morning, I can barely stand up straight out of bed, I'm sore, I'm tired. I mean, you know, I don't have to run 20 miles. I can run 10 and do like a 3K swim afterwards. You know, I'm still aerobically training. I'm still getting fit. And the swim is almost like a recovery session. And next thing, lo and behold, I'm fresh as a daisy and good to go again on Sunday. Before maybe training for the 12 and 12, rewind back even further, training for single marathons I was starting out. If the program said 20 miles, I did 20 miles, even if my left calf was ready to tear or if I was super fatigued or something. So I've kind of flipped it over on the other side where now is that I'm, I, you know, I kind of, my training's almost non-linear. I plan it week by week. You know, I see how I feel. I see what my schedule is. You know, you, if you plan it yourself? I do. Yeah. For this kind of stuff, I do because, you know, There's I no coach out there. Not really, not really for this kind of stuff. I mean, you know, you have guys around the world like, you know, James Lawrence who did 50 Ironmans, 50 days. I've been, I've chatted to him a lot online. Um, so he's helped me out a couple of things. Like I said, that guy at home who's, who's won the deck Ironman. You know, we have guys, one of the top ultra runners in Europe lives in Ireland. So I've, I've kind of chatted to a couple of guys and it's just, you know, it's just, we get the same, the same kind of information comes back and around almost in different ways, you know, train hard, listen to your body and just just give it a go you know so it's uh yeah it's it's conducting experiments on myself i guess that uh that'll hopefully be never ending well all right so you you do all this to raise money for spina bifida and hydrocephalus hydrocephalus uh can you tell us a little bit about what that is so again that's a, it's kind of like the opposite extreme of, of what you're doing, like like Uber Fitness and then just something that can be so debilitating. Can you, yeah. can you tell us a little bit about what spina bifida and hydrocephalus is? Yeah, sure. So, for, you know, I suppose my first entry, I guess, into to spina bifida and hydrocephalus was, was my cousin Mary. So, again, spina bifida and hydrocephalus actually varies in, in severity between people. Um, one of the top guys in AIG in the world has spina bifida, but you can't tell. So, it, it very it ranges hugely from, from, from people who suffer, suffer quite badly, and they have very, very limited range of motion and very, very limited um, quality of life to people who can live actually quite normal lives. So, basically, spina bifida is, is it's, it's either Greek or Latin for 
or split spine. So when a baby's born, their spine grows up and down and it meets, and that's how the spine is formed. In spina bifida babies, it, it doesn't meet, hence the you know the the back problems and you know often being confined to a wheelchair things like that and um, so obviously my cousin mary she has quite a quite a severe form of that and then hydro hydrocephalus basically means fluid on the brain now sometimes you can have one or the other quite often you can have both and you know with the fluid on the brain your spinal cord pumps fluid from your brain so if you've got a spinal cord split or you've got a spina bifida or if you've got a spinal cord issue quite often you'll develop what's called hydrocephalus and that's just retaining fluid on the brain um so you know, like again i said it varies some people live quite normal lives some people can some people can walk and carry out normal everyday things and other people can't use a fork and knife so it it, it varies quite greatly and i suppose when i started first you know it was my first cousin mary who was my first entry into the looking and helping out the charity and then i got to meet families and kids from all over ireland um, who are living with the condition and you have kids you know parents who have to modify their whole houses that they've bought just to put a bathroom in downstairs in their house for their kid who, who can't go up and down the stairs all this kind of stuff so it varies and, it, and it's quite tough for people you know so it's really opened my eyes to, to kind of, again you know it might be a an easy thing to say but for how grateful i am that i can do what i do and that i actually have the opportunity to do and test myself and do 24 marathons in 24 days or even attempt crossing america um you know so they're the people i'm representing and you know when the going gets tough i'm going to be thinking about my cousin and those little kids in galway and dublin and cork and that you know they're 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 relying on me to do these things and to finish these things because they get better quality of life so yeah my, my next question was uh to, you know to what extent does you know, running and doing these things for charity uh how does that affect your your either your um your outlook on what you're doing it, why you're doing it, or or why you're doing it. Yeah. You know, my question is, uh, endurance sports can get a little bit selfish, right? Yeah. Whether it's an Ironman or a marathon, yeah. you're, you're focusing on yourself. And even if even if like we're talking about like the experiments on yourself, and you're you're looking to see what you can do and pushing the envelope further, and those are amazing things and 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 worthwhile pursuits. But at the end of the day, you're doing it for yourself. Yeah. You know. So how does running for charity, running for other people, how does that affect? your training, your racing, mm -hmm. your outlook, your everything. Sure, sure. Yeah, it's I've had a lot of I've I've thought about this quite a lot over the last couple of years and I guess you know, for me it's very very hard for me to get into to total line on an Ironman and to really like be deep deep deeply deeply competitive with the other guys and girls that are there. Now it it does it comes out on race day. Obviously, you know, you want to you want to come out and you want to do well in your age group and you want to do well overall and all this kind of stuff, but for me at the moment I want to because I'm fit and healthy, I want to offer as much as I can to the organization because I know that like, you know, I'm, I'm mid twenties. I know like my fastest Ironman, I hope is still 10 years away. You know what I mean? So I like, I have plenty of time to actually compete and to actually, you know, on day 36 of racing across America. Yeah. Yeah. I'll do an Ironman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so I've got plenty of time to actually compete and actually be really competitive. So, you know, it, it's, 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 um, <clears throat> yeah it's it's very different um I, I like you know i again competitive running even back home i don't do a lot of actually competitive races to race other guys you know what i mean i do a lot of races and stuff but i'm never out there to try and beat other people at the moment i'm focusing as hard as i can on training on, on beating myself and like i said i will agree 100 percent. it is a very very selfish sport and i think we as endurance athletes we have to accept that that in order to do well you do have to be a little bit selfish too you know so it's just to find that uh find that balance but at the moment i'm kind of like you know i'm competitive with myself because i have plenty of time i think hopefully <laughs> touch wood to be competitive with other people so you know there's a uh, i think there's i think there's time there for me yet hopefully so during a whether it's 24 marathons in 24 days or this race across america wh what is what is your nutrition what was it like what are you plan what is it going to be like yeah, were, were so, you just like digest, you know, just like Gatorade and gels for for twenty four days? Was so that your uh, here's here's a funny statistic: uh, completed Ironman Lake Placid Sunday was my first time ever doing an Ironman not taking a gel. You didn't take a gel, not a single gel. That was yeah, that was the other thing I didn't mention was that yeah. about a week ago, um, <laughs> Shane here did Ironman Lake Placid. Yeah. Uh, we were talking about that, which is, again is like my favorite place of all time. But let's get back to this. You did, and you, you had a pretty good time. Like you're yeah, you, yeah, you, I was uh, top ten percent of well, I was in top 
10 percent of athletes there on the day yeah that's great a, yeah i was uh yeah no gels first first time what, coming in Ireland, no gels well, let's talk about that let's <laughs> yeah this, it's a, this is a story so i guess you know after, i think i think during, during an ironman i think i have somewhere in the vicinity of 15 gels i've done ironman so i've taken 18 gels yeah yeah and you better make sure you're sitting on an aisle seat on the plane on the way home wherever you're coming from because <laughs> it's uh not a good time but <clears throat> yeah so i finished the 24 marathons 24 days I finished in pretty good shape. I knew, you know, going into this, I was like, how do you fuel yourself to do such a thing? Um, so I fuel myself with, you know, real good quality, high quality food. Like I was eating oatmeal for breakfast every morning, all this kind of stuff. This was during? This was during the 24 and the lead up going into it. You know, I'm very, very lucky where I'm from in Ireland that we have some incredibly fresh food and fish. I live beside the sea, you know, so we have like, I come from a small little farm, so we have our own land. The guy who lives beef. beside the sea that can't swim. Couldn't swim till now. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so, you know, I was very, very lucky to, to fuel my body, with, with nourish my body with good food going into it. And I just knew afterwards, I was like, all right, I said, you know, when I continue to do this stuff, I'm going to have to seek out the assistance of, you know, professionals. So again, one of the top ultra runners in Ireland is also one of the top endurance nutritionists in Europe. So he does some work with, you know, he's worked with Jan Ferdino. He's done stuff with BMC cycling. Jan Ferdino is multi-time Ironman champion. Yeah. Olympic. Pretty was sure. He, was he a gold medalist? He was Olympic gold medalist, Ironman 70.3 world champ. Um, he's stud. probably, probably going to be this year. I think this year's Ironman world champ too. Total, total stud. I don't think anybody's going to be. He's him. a vegetarian now. Really? He was last year, which I think is actually part of the reason why he had a bad race. Really? He, it was, yeah. I think when you switch from yeah, it takes su- a lot. Such, a, such a drastic change like that, it takes a lot. It takes a lot. It takes a time to adjust to that. It takes a lot. So I, I reached out to this guy in Ireland. I was like, hey, look, just did this. I want to do more. I realized that, you know, I know how to train. I don't want to get myself fit. I think, you know, I could do some work on my nutrition. Um, and this guy, Barry Murray is his name. He's a, he's won 200k ultra marathons around Ireland, like running for 24 hours straight. All this, I was like, all right, what 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 are you eating? You know, he's like, you want to go for coffee? And I was like, yes. So you know, Barry's kind of opened up this whole world of kind of fat adaptation to me. Um, that I am learning a lot. Um, so you know, I'm like, yeah, you know, I'm only eating carbs now after I train. This kind of stuff. You know, I'm, like I had a pizza after Iron Man. No, you know, so during the Iron, like for example, in the Iron Man, I had we have like little na- naked bars they're called from back in Ireland. They brought a load of those at me. Some shop blocks on the bike on the run. I think I ate like half a banana and like about twelve cups of coke. And you know that was that was kind of it. But I found a kind of a next level of endurance by you know I'm not getting any sugar crashes. My insulin's not spiking. You're not you know you're not feeling weak when you're out training. Like eight miles into a twenty mile run, you're not looking for sugar and gels. So I'm now less dependent on sugar to train as an endurance athlete, and that is something that I wanted to do myself um, for long term health. You know what I mean? Because when the twenty four marathons finished, I was like, oh great, okay. You know, that's it. Like, what do you want to do now? And I said, all right, I want to make sure that, you know, when I'm 45, 50, that if I want to do something like this again, I can do it. So my goals have changed as an endurance athlete. My goal, number one goal now is to be healthy. So when I look at guys like this and look at guys he's, he's coaching, I'm like, all right, you know what? I want to, he coaches a guy, I don't know if anybody follows pro cycling, a guy called Svein Tuft. He's a Canadian cyclist with a Michelin Scott. And he's the oldest guy in the Giro d'Italia. He didn't race a Tour de France. He's 41 years old. And this guy heads out with like for a five hour bike ride with like nuts and half an avoca- half half avoc- avocado stuffed on the back of his jer- jersey. And he's still competing at this level at 41 years old. So, you know, things started to click. I was like, all right, so these guys are getting serious longevity in their careers. I mean, Barry's competing at the very, very highest of running in Ireland and he's a lot older than a lot of the guys he's racing. So I'm like, you know, I don't want to be. 30 and like have carbohydrate syndrome and insulin resistance syndrome and all this kind of stuff i was like what's carbohydrate syndrome so it's basically you can see like actually if you guys if you google it pete jacobs had severe insulin sensitivity syndrome so they just a, a whole life of consuming bagels and pastas and oats and gels on gels so Pete jacobs is another iron man champion yeah 2012 i believe 2012 um you know and, and it just you just reliance on sugar so again i suppose step back from endurance sports if you the amount of sugar that endurance athletes consume it's not healthy and it's, it's not good you know so what i what i started realizing that it, days that i wasn't training or doing like i couldn't i could not stay awake like I was, I was drinking like seven coffees and I was looking for food and food and food and food. And I was like, all right, this is not, I, 
I, you know, I can't keep living like this. This is very unhealthy. <laughs> I mean, look, you know, I was looking at it from a kind of more of a holistic point of view. So I, I swish, I reached out to him. I said, look, I need, need some help. Or what you recommend? And he's like, all right. He said, you know, you're just going to be feeding yourself more so on good fats and protein. And then you can, con- like he goes, it's not keto. It's not no carb. It's consume your carbs after you train. So I was like, all right. I said, you know, I'm mid twenties. I have friends. I go out back and home no, in Ireland. No sugar while, while training? Try go no sugar. So I'm doing a lot of fasted training. So I'd head out on the bike for four hours with just two bottles of water or maybe I'd have a coffee beforehand or. I know. did, I did four hours today. I did. I drank six bottles. Yeah, well, it's a lot more humid here than it is back in Ireland. <laughs> yeah. It's a bit, yeah, it's a bit. I ran five miles in Central Park this morning and I'm pretty sure I almost died. But it's, uh, you know, so I'm doing a lot of fasted training and then your body adapts and it starts using fat as a fuel source. Um, so again, you see, we as endurance athletes, I don't know what it is, but, you know, we keep thinking that we need energy. And energy means gels and bars and all this kind of stuff. Whereas we have a load of energy in our body uh, in the form of fat. And it's a, it's a huge engine if you can tap into that. And you look at all the best kind of ultra runners in the world, they're all like, they're all fat adapted. Um, you know, and it, it's interesting to me that I was like, I, you know, when I started working with him, I started learning all this stuff. I was like, people need to, why don't people know this? Like people need to, you know, and it, it, I think for the endurance sports nutrition, a lot of it is, a lot of it comes down to marketing. So you're, you know, you've got a young guy, he's following this guy on Instagram and he drinks all these and there's all the gels. He, so he buys those online and he has no idea why he's taking them and he has no idea how they're they're doing to his body. But because the box says he takes one every 20 minutes on the bike, he takes like, then he has to drink one every 15 minutes on the run. That's what he does. and He doesn't know why he's doing it. So I'm v- glad I'm, I've only scratched the surface of my nutrition that I've completely overhauled the last year, but I'm excited to see where it goes because I feel now like I can go... I'm not relying on huge breakfast every morning. I can go out like this morning I went out, I made my way up to Central Park, no breakfast, just got a coffee on my way, ran, got my food afterwards, things like that. You become less reliant and you're kind of simplifying the complexities, I guess, really to, to wrap it up, you know? So you, so you consume your, your calories and your carbohydrates post-workout, post-race? Complete complete opposite of what they say you should do in endurance worlds, yeah. Yeah. How, how long did it take you to adjust from, you know, from from sugar to <sighs> to like a, like a fat-based fuel? I'm going to say four months. As like I remember going out. I would have guessed longer. Well, I, I had four months where I was going out on the, on the, like on a, on a one hour bike and only doing a one hour bike. Cause I was afraid. I was like, I need going to do a one hour loop from my house. Cause I was like, if I crash, I said, I'm like, I'm going to have to eat grass or something on the side of the road in Ireland. I was like, I, I you know, so it took, it took some time. Um, again, I, I'm, I'm turning into a fan of it. Kind of not a fan of, it. I do a lot of indoor training at home. I don't know if anybody, any of your listeners have ever been to Ireland our roads are crazy. So a lot of people get knocked off their bike and hit by cars when they're running and stuff. So I don't want that to happen. So I train a lot indoors. So, you know, I'm like, all right, let's do a two hour turbo. If you crash and energy, the fridge is there. You know what I mean? So it took me a long time. And even now I'm still like, you know, I'm up to, I would run, do like a mountain run in Ireland. I would run up from my house to the town. It's maybe two hours, 45 minutes. I can do that fasted now. I can do four-hour bike fasted. Um, I mean, my breakfast the morning in the Ironman was I had two eggs. I had like some cheese wrapped up in salami, um, like two handfuls of nuts and a spoon, couple of spoonfuls of avocado. That was my breakfast. I actually ate it in sitting in Lake Pass in the village in my car. I just ate it and went to the swim and <laughs> that was it, you know. So I'm, like I had my energy was dead steady all day and no crashes, nothing. That's great. And with minimal calories. My, yep. my buddy, uh, Greg Close, who's a local uh, New York City pro triathlete, he, like, we would do workouts together, and he, he was, he's on more on your, your side, mm. you know, where he's, he's minimal calories, you know, I sure. think he, he's proud that he did, uh, I mean, he goes, I think he's, he's, you know, an eight and a half hour Ironman wow. guy, he's, he's yeah, fast. He's pretty quick. And uh, he, he talks about how he has, you know, he'll take on something in the order of 700 calories in, in, in gels or sugar or something like that, which is nothing, I mean, yeah. compared to what a lot yeah. of people are taking on. Yep. Um, and he, he looks at what I do and he's just like, what the hell are you doing? You're doing yeah. It's, I mean, it's the thing about but it. I've had it's, success with it. So it's, yeah, it's completely it's, it's personal. Hard to, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's hard to, 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 I don't know. It's hard to change. I think one of the things that people need also need to understand is that, you know, what works for me might not work for anybody else and they might have to do it a different way. You know, just cause I eat this before a long run or I eat this after a long run, you know, you, you have to mess around and see what works for you. And, but the principles of the kind of fat ad- adaptation stuff stay the same. So yeah, look, you know, a lot of top cyclists and top triathletes around the world now are kind of, you know, it's a bit of an underground thing, but people are kind of starting to buy into it, which is just kind of cool. And I'm, I'm excited to see where it goes over the next 
three or four years for me. But you know, I could be back here in New York City in four years' time and say, "Oh yeah, what I said there four years ago, I'm do not doing that anymore." <laughs> so that that could happen too. So it's just to to take take it take it as you see it and experiment and see what works best That's for you. Exactly, this is the experiment. You know, yep. it's uh, as I'm listening to, you, I'm starting to think. You know, maybe maybe after this season, it's we're yeah. mid <laughs> yeah. we're midway through the season right yeah, now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> maybe I won't make any drastic changes right now, but uh, maybe come come fall winter, maybe sure. I'll start start yeah. trying this out. Uh, yeah, you, you just get so dependent on it. And then you, I've tried it where like, I'll do a workout or I'll even, I'll just forget to like bring gels or something like that. I'm like, sure. yeah, I'll be fine. All of a sudden I'm like, I'm not fine. I'm not fine. <laughs> I'm shaking. Yeah. Oh God. Where's the next store? <laughs> yeah. So what is, so after, uh, after the, 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 um, uh, the race across America, uh, what are you, what are your, what are your plans after that? Be it in a year or two from now, in 10, 20 years from now, what, yeah. do, you, what do you see Shane Finn doing? Uh, okay, so at the moment... I just asked a 25-year-old what he's planning on doing with the rest of his life. Yeah, so I have absolutely give me an accurate no answer. idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's as accurate as I can go. I, look, I, again, I, I think I just uh, I did a little Q&A on my Instagram last night. Somebody asked, what, what's the plans for the future? R- again, it's the cliched answer, to be honest, after between now and the race across America, I don't have a whole pile. There's, I'm just tunnel vision on that. Uh, as as a personal thing, I, I I do want to qualify for Kona. That's just once. That's it. And when I get that in the bag, great. Um, after that, you know, it's funny. I, I shared. I tell my mom this all the time. I'm doing all this stuff now, so my future wife doesn't hate me. Um, so I get all this kind of crazy <laughs> stuff out of the way, and then I can just talk about it for the rest of my life. But um, yeah, I mean, like back at home, I'm. <laughs> Back at home, um, you know, I just set up St. Shane Finn Training as a company. I do a lot of corporate stuff. Um, I go into a big company in Dublin. I would roll out like a Desta 5K program for like 100 clients. Um, they'd have 100 staff involved and that kind of stuff. I got like do some work with Boston Scientific at home in Galway, doing a lot of public speaking at home in, in Ireland, um, which I absolutely love. And it's opening up a lot of doors for me too. So, you know, and I know the thing as well, like this this America trip will probably open up doors too, and you never know what what I'm thinking right now. Like this time next year, I you know I'll be, I'll be finished the race across America, so you know that could have opened up more doors for me, and I could be gone in a completely different direction. You're so gonna be sponsored by Cliff next year. Oh yeah, yeah. I hope <laughs> if they're listening, uh, that would be great. Yeah, but uh, no, I, again, so if they're listening, you're never gonna be sponsored uh, by Cliff. <laughs> no, I don't think so. No, so I don't like the sugar guys. But it's uh, no, it's it's just again, it sounds like again, I don't know, maybe it's not a typical twenty five year old answer but in, in 25 years time I'd, I'd just love to be healthy and being able to do what i do and if i can do it and help other people along the way well then it, it makes uh it makes it pretty fulfilling for me that's uh that's really great i think at a, at a young age you have um again really ambitious goals and you're executing them phenomenally and uh it's, I'm, I'm very impressed with you i'm very impressed with uh everything you're doing everything you've done so what what else is that what else can we expect from uh from or well where else can we find uh uh shane finn where uh, where can we, you know, yeah. give us your website, your yeah, Instagram, sure. your sure. all your handles. Yeah. Incidentally, you uh, have a great TED talk. Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. So that was actually the hardest talk I've ever done because uh, usually, you know, you've got no sight. It's completely dark. It's roasting hot on on the stage. Um, so it just it's one thing I wanted to do. I guess you know, I'll give you a little bit of a brief background. As a kid, I was incredibly shy. Very, very, you know, I never speak in front of my parents, not a minor room full of people. So when the opportunity came up, I wanted to do it and put myself under pressure and to actually do it. So I, I enjoyed that. Uh, taught me a lot. Again, when I go into companies, I speak, it's, you know, I have my slides, my PowerPoints and all that kind of stuff. But this was just completely uh, off the cuff. Um, we had to learn to script it and stuff like that. But yeah, it was good. I enjoyed it. And uh, definitely a different uh, Shane Finn to what I was 10 years ago. And I was like a very, very quiet and shy kid and stuff like that. But I guess now, you know, it's a kind of a saying like when you get to you know when you no longer kind of care about what the world wants for you and you just focus on what you want to do um you get to a very very dangerous level of freedom you know what i mean so you can kind of do whatever you want to do go wherever you want to go talk to whoever you want to talk to and just do your thing um so that's kind of where where, where i'm headed and i uh, appreciate the kind words um so yeah i've got my own website it's uh www.shanefin.com pretty easy uh, and then i'm at instagram on at underscore shane finn and then my facebook page is shane finn running so uh it's all pretty pretty easy i'm on twitter and linkedin too at shane finn and above those so uh yeah trying to keep all the all the social media balls in the air which is which is pretty pretty tough to do sometimes that is tough to do yeah i, I, just, I just want to ask you one last question about what you just said uh so you kind of changed who you were. Um, yeah. You said like a really shy person to obviously not a shy person anymore. Yeah, yeah. Uh, is I mean, you you listen to people like David Goggins who said that they just kind of uh, you just 
<laughs> I love that guy. <laughs> <laughs> who say they, they, they created these characters and would eventually become these different people. Is this mm. just kind of like a mind over matter thing for you to become that I, gregarious, outgoing person? I, I don't know what it is. It's To be honest, it's strange. It's not even like, yeah, I'm outgoing, but there are still situations and things like, like I'm I'm still quite shy, you know what I mean? But I'm very comfortable and I'm very open and confident in my little world you know what i mean um i mean I, like if i was sitting down here now with a guy who had no idea what endurance was or had no idea what an ironman was or did not understand why i was trying to cross america i would be you know, i wouldn't be very open with him i'd feel like maybe he doesn't understand he thinks i'm crazy etc cetera, etc cetera. but i guess i don't know what it was 15 16 17 i was very, struggled for confidence i was not very skint self-confident didn't have a lot of ambition this kind of stuff you know and then next thing bang out of nowhere decided to run a marathon and i quickly realized after that that yeah you know you did it um but it was the first thing in my life that i actually achieved for myself so i realized as i was in my early 20s i was, I was, I was like huh the reason you played so much team sports is because it was very comfortable everything wasn't on you and next thing i flipped it around to the marathon stuff i was like oh hold on you can do something for yourself challenge yourself make yourself proud and help other people that made me feel really good and when i started to do that and then care less about the other stuff it, it kind of changed me i guess who i am not to the extent of david goggins but uh you know i guess a similar similar trait um i don't know you're doing some pretty impressive things he he's he's an impressive guy but you're again 24 marathons 24 days yeah. racing across america these are not small goals these are not things that uh, uh a weak person would be doing no, you're, obviously no. you're clearly mentally strong you're clearly physically strong and i'm really interested to see what you do next and what you continue to do and the amount of money you raise in sure. the future but shane thank you very much for joining us this was a fantastic conversation uh again i'm i'm, I'm happy to see where you're going uh again just whatever whatever help i can provide for you Fantastic. which i said to you before uh if you're looking for a training partner or some sort of somebody to, somebody to do a couple days of riding with you across yeah. america <laughs> yeah. i'd be happy to do that i think that'd be a fun thing to do that but uh Fantastic. shane thanks once more to, one, one last time thank you very much for joining us and uh hope we do this again thank you so much i really appreciate it all right and to all you listening out there in podcast land thank you very much for joining us and just keep on running <laughs>